We have all been brought up with the notion, I think, that the resolution of a light microscope that uses regular lenses and focused visible light is fundamentally limited by diffraction. Now, for that reason, the electron microscope was invented, and of course, it's getting probe microscopes, and there's no doubt about the fact that as a result of the higher spatial resolution these microscopes have attained, they have fundamentally changed our understanding of the world. However, it's also important to realize that uh, if you want to apply this microscope to certain things, for example, to living cells, they are fundamentally limited in the way they operate. Because if you want to look inside a cell, inside a live cell in particular, inside live tissue, there is no alternative to using focused visible light. Because focused light is the only way to gain information from inside an intact cell and get this information outside without disturbing the fundamental functions of a living um, uh, cell or organism. Now, for that reason, it made a lot of sense to readdress the resolution issue and to ask, is there really no way to overcome the limits set by diffraction to come up with a light microscope that has a spatial resolution of a sort of an electron microscope? Now, today we know that this is possible, at least for fluorescent imaging. This is a subfield of microscopy which uses fluorescence tags in order to see the objects of interest. But as I will explain towards the end, it's not fundamentally limited to fluorescent imaging because the underlying physical principles are significantly more general. Now, I'm going to explain it in a very simple way. Now, we all know that in a light microscope, the job of a lens is to focus the light down to a point. But the lens will fail in doing so simply because light propagates as a wave. And so what we will get here is a blob of diffraction intensity, a diffraction maximum that is at least about 200 nanometers wide and about 500 nanometers along the optic axis. And so if we're having several features, several objects, falling within that distance, falling within that region. They will be illuminated at the same time, and they will give off light at the same time. And so no detector will ever be able to separate a signal if they are of the same kind. Now, the man who realized this problem first with all the consequences was this man, Ernst Abbe, who lived at the end of the 19th century, as we all know. And he coined this diffraction resolution barrier in an equation which is still named after him. It's basically saying, that in order to be separated in a light microscope, two features of the same kind have to be further away than the wavelengths divided by twice the numerical aperture of the objective lens. And of course, you can find this equation basically in any textbook of physics or optics, and also cell and molecular biology, because in these fields, uh, the light microscope plays a preeminent role, as I indicated already. Now, you may know or not know that Ernst Abbe has had many contributions uh, to optics, but for some reason, this diffraction resolution barrier is regarded as his most scientific legacy. Because if you happen to travel to Jena, where he lived and worked, you will find this memorial erected in his honor and this equation written in stone. And this is what we want to beat now. We would like to show that we will find a way to discern features of the same kind that are closer than the distance d. Now, if you don't believe in this, you probably still have to believe in something. And what I believed in, that in a fluorescence microscope, if you fully exploit the properties of fluorophore, the spectral properties of fluorophore, there must be features, there must be transitions out there in that fluorophore that will allow you to get sharper images. So why was this unusual at that time, early 90s? It was unusual because at that time people thought the role of a fluorophore in a fluorescence microscope is to work as a label. You attach the fluorophore, for example, to a protein, then you know exactly where the protein is located. Or maybe you can use the fluorophore, for example, to measure ion concentration, such as calcium concentration or pH. But here the notion was different. Perceive the fluorophore as a vehicle to break the diffraction barrier. So there must be transitions out there in a dye that allows you to get a spatial resolution beyond the diffraction barrier. Now, philosophy is fine, but in the end, you have to come up with something that really works. And the first concept that worked with a focus in light microscope is the concept of a stat microscopy. And I'm briefly explaining how this microscope works. Again, we have a lens, and the role of the lens is, of course, to focus the light down to a point. And we have a laser, for example, an excitation uh, a light source uh, providing light, this green light shown in here, bouncing off this dichroic mirror. And the lens, of course, will focus the light down to this focal region in order to excite molecules, fluorescent molecules, from their ground state to the fluorescent state, usually 
they will dwell a bit in that lower-lying uh, vibration level of the first electronic excited state about nanosecond, and they come down by emitting a fluorescent photon, and that fluorescent photon, of course, uh, is collected by the same objective and goes this way and measured here in the, in the detector. So, this is the process of generating fluorescence. This is a simplified energy diagram of an organic fluorophore. Now, the lens, of course, as I said, will not succeed in focusing the light any sharper than to about 200 nanometers. So, all the molecules falling within that distance will be excited more or less at the same time, statistically, and then they will come down to the ground state by emitting fluorescent photons more or less at the same time. So, the objective lens, of course, will register. Uh, the, the, the light that is emitted here from this region, and then we will go to the detector, and what we will get, we will get here a signal that is the sum of the signal generator of all these features. How do we get an image in this case? Well, we have to scan that spot across the specimen like this, and then we get point by point the signal generated here at the detector, and then we get an image. That's clear. But it's also clear you won't be able to discern features that are closer than this distance. It will not be possible to discern what is lying within that distance simply because they emit at about the same time. Now, if this is the problem, we have to find a solution for it. Now, you can say, well, one solution would be to make that region of, gen of fluorescence generation or excitation smaller, but clearly the lens is not able to do a better job than that. So, if the lens is not able to do a better job than this, there's only one thing that could do the job. It must be somehow in the dye. There must be a feature out there in the dye, a transition out there in the dye, that will allow us in the end to generate a signal from fewer molecules that are just here covered by the excitation light. Now, if you're trained as a physicist and you ask, what could that be? Then I think if you think a bit about it, you think, oh, there must be such a thing. It's called simulated emission. Because just as we can excite the dye, to generate fluorescence. We can also de-excite the dye by pushing the molecule down to the ground state and hence stop the spontaneous emission of light, stop the fluorescence. And this is very simple. We need photons that are redshifted in wavelength so that they are not able to excite the molecule from the ground state down to the uh, up to the excited state. But according to very basic laws of molecular physics, they will notice those molecules that happen to be located here in a nanosecond lift fluorescent state produce a copy photon of themselves, a stimulated photon. That goes this way. We don't care about it. It has the same wavelength, same direction. But the net result is the molecule will instantaneously go down to the ground state and will not be able to emit spontaneously anymore because it has been quenched. Now, if you're worried about the fact that you may generate, of course, uh, uh, an excitation from here to here, don't worry. Because the state into which the molecule is dumped here, this higher vibration level, is a very quickly decaying state. It decays within less than a picosecond. So once the molecule is down here, you can safely rely on the fact that it will not be able to fresh because it will instantly fall down to the lowest vibrational state at room temperature. And now you can imagine what we do. We use that beam of light but phase modify in such a way, put in a phase plate, not to make a spot in here, but to make a ring, a donut. And now, as you can see, we can stop molecules lying here at the outer part of the focus, and they cannot emit if they are hit by a stimulating photon because they are shut off. Now, that must improve the spatial resolution a bit because we see now the signal from fewer photons as a result of the implementation of the red beam. But that would be much in the scheme because only a few molecules are stopped. So what we want to do, we would stop more so that fewer molecules in here are able to emit light. How could we do that? Well, one option would be to make the ring smaller, but Abe would say, no way. You cannot make smaller rings than spot. There's no way. That's also limited by diffraction. But we don't need to do that. The only thing we need to do is we need to stop the floor for. And to stop the floor for, the only thing we have to do is we have to put in enough red light, enough red photons, so that we can be sure that in the case the molecule gets excited, there is always a photon out there that will kick down the molecule by stimulated emission. So we have to crank up the intensity such that we can be sure that the dye will always be quenched in the case it gets excited. In fact, if you calculate or measure the probability of a molecule to emit or to reside in that fluorescent state, if you flood it with stimulating light, with red photons, the population of this state will decay exponentially. That's clear. With the intensity of the beam applied, you will empty that state. The probability of populating the state will decrease substantially. And so, we can say, if the intensity of the red beam is beyond a certain threshold, we have basically switched off the dye, because the dye is not able to assume this state. Because once it's in here, it's instantly kicked down. And now it's clear what we want to do. 
increase the intensity of the red beam in such a way that even in the weaker parts, where it's weaker in percentage, say 20% of the maximum, it's still beyond the threshold. Still beyond the threshold. So we increase it further up, and more and more molecules will be shut off. You see, only these are now allowed to emit. And now we get a signal specifically from this region. So the job of the stimulating beam, and the only role of the stimulating, um, of, of the stimulating emission beam, which we call the stat beam, is to switch off the dye. Disallow the population of this state. All the molecules here are flooded with excitation light. No way out. No way out. But only these here are allowed to emit. And that's the trick. And now we must get sharper pictures. It's very clear because we get the signal more selectively in space. And here it is in this view graph. Here we can separate these two from those three because at a time all of them were excited. Only this one were allowed to emit. And only these one are allowed to emit here. Here's nothing. We don't know whether, if there is something because we just scan. But here there are three. Here we can separate them, and now clearly we must get a higher spatial resolution. So this is the basic principle. Does it work? That was the big question. The answer is yes, it does. I would like to give you a few examples. Here's one example. On the left-hand side, you see a recording of a so-called confocal microscope. That's a high-end, uh, say, say, diffraction-limited microscope. These are single molecules dispersed on a surface. Confocal standard on the left, standard on the right. Now you can see. These two molecules are clearly discerned. Here they are not. Why? Here they gave off light at the same time. But here, at the time this one was emitting, this one was stopped. At the time this one was emitting, this one was stopped. And so we could see and separate the signals. So we could see them separately. Now, this works for single molecule. And the point I'm making here, that's the nice about the physics of it, this is just by applying the appropriate molecular transition, on-off transition. There is no, we need not any, say, information about distribution of molecules, density of molecules, or whatever. Just we, we apply the right set of beams to do the right transitions, and here you got a sharper picture. OK. Now, this was single molecules. These are sort of more complicated features, uh, confocal on the left, stand on the right. This is uh, um, a kind of 2D crystal of, um, of polymer beads. Again, just by molecular transitions. Then. The next step was show that you can do this, um, say, in a useful way. For example, apply it to distribution of proteins in a cell, because this is where uh, fluorescence imaging has so many advantages, because we can tag proteins very specifically in a cell and then see these specific proteins. Now, this is a normal diffraction-limited confocal recording of a, a plasma membrane patch of molecules, and I see there is almost no structure. Here you see the details quite clearly. By the way, these are so-called SNARE proteins, SNAP25, which plays an important role for synaptic vesicle fusion. So for neurobiologists, this is, this is very important because this defines the region, for example, where so-called vesicles fuse um, uh, with the uh, presynaptic uh, membrane in the cell. OK, again, just by molecular transitions, raw data, if you like. You can do computational improvement, if you like, but there's no need to because the physics does the job. OK, now the next step in the development was to show that you uh, learn something specifically. And so uh, we teamed up, actually, with a colleague in the institute I work in, Reinhard Jan. And um, uh, Reinhard is a neurobiologist who is interested in finding out how the synapse works in neurons. And now what you see in here is a sketch of a neuron. Uh, at the time we started the study, People knew, of course, that neurons communicate by having a synaptic vesicle fuse with the membrane in here, and then it spills neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. And this fusion is mediated by proteins. Now, the question was, what happens with the proteins that do the job of fusion? Do they stay at this place when the fusion takes place, or are they smeared out? This is important to understand the recycling machinery of these proteins, because the proteins have to be used again. Now, uh, with confocal microscopy, one couldn't tell. Uh, because this could be due to diffraction, this blur, uh, or of course it could also be due to the fact that the proteins are smeared out. Now I said to him, why don't you do electron microscopy? And I said, oh, that's hard. Because it's very hard to stain proteins specifically in a, uh, el a electron microscopy preparation. It's very difficult. You don't get the statistics and so on. This is why this was a question for many, many years, despite the fact that electron microscopy was out there. And so we did it with that, and we could discern now the protein as the patches, so to speak, of individual uh, synaptic vesicles and, and come up with a conclusion, of course, after doing many 
many controls that the synaptic vesicle protein, synaptic diagonal 1, which is investigated here, remains clustered after exocytosis, at least in large parts. And this gave insights into how the cell and the neurons work. Just another example uh, done with here with uh, another biologist colleague, um, Stefan Sigis, now at the uh, University of Berlin. And at that time, so um, he wanted to find out if a particular protein, which has a German name, Bruchpilot, which is important in, uh, in Drosophila, so in the fruit fly, in the presynaptic active, active zone formation. That's a detail. He wanted to know how that protein is arranged in space. Again, standard resolution, he couldn't tell. With the high spatial resolution of STAT, he saw for the first time that this uh, protein, the end, the C-terminal end, forms baskets. And that helped arrange this presynaptic active zone. So this was the insight that was generated in here. So here I'm showing you more recent data done in two color recordings uh, where we also labeled the end terminal end, so the other end of the, of the protein. And uh, just to give you an idea, so you see very clearly this basket shape. And this model, um, well, it probably wouldn't have been there without the STAT investigations. But, well, if you're a physicist, of course, you're interested just in the resolution gain. So this is what you have in raw data with STAT, and this you have is the normal confocal microscope. And this is nice to see that the physics works out that way. You get this information. Okay. Now, physics, I think, is sort of obvious. But what about, what about making it simple, this methodology? Because then, of course, you can disseminate it widely. This was very important in order, um, uh, in order to make it more accessible, of course, and make it more applicable. So we put a lot of effort in that. Initially, I should say, and those of you who have some notion of optics or quantum optics, know that, oh, this is a relatively complex laser system. We use those laser systems initially because we thought we have to have the right wavelengths for the excitation. We have to have the right wavelengths for the stimulated emission. We have to play with, the, uh, with whether it's pulsed and the pulse is short or long and so on. All good reasons uh, to use that. And of course, another reason was it gave nice images. But at the end of the day, these systems easily cost something like 300,000 to 500,000 euros, at least at that time. And so we had to do something in that regard. Now, fortunately, we were helped by, I would say, major development in laser physics that took place during the last five years. And one of them is the generation of supercontinua, which has implications for other things, of course. But here, these supercontinuum sources were actually quite handy to get the right wavelengths for excitation, say, visible light, green light, and doing, say, redshifted light for doing the switching off of the dye by stimulated emission. And so we set up uh, such a stat microscope basically for our students, lab course. And so this is a uh, 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 gain in resolution that you get with your uh, lab course um, uh, kind of uh, setup, fortgeschritten practical. Okay, now this is actually taken by, uh, by a student at that time. Now this is just uh, two color recordings uh, from something not so nice, the tumor cells, uh, Diffraction limited and now uh, sub diffraction. And if the room was a bit dimmer, you could see the so called clattering coated pits in here. And these are uh, very important structures. Um, and now you can correlate, of course, this protein is better in space and learn something uh, about their role. Now, it has also become commercially available. The, the reason why I'm showing this is the following uh, this is a standard commercial confocal microscope that biologists used. They put a sample, push a button, and then they get get a three-dimensional picture, for example, just by scanning. Now, what we've done in here, uh, or the company did to be precise, uh, they added, um, say, uh, a beam of light that does the, the turning off of the fluorescence by, by stimulated emission, and that produces sharper pictures. So in the end, of course, the biologists can use the system as before. Uh, of course, it's clear that the wavelengths for stimulating down the dye down to the ground, say, for keeping the dye dark, have to be tuned to the spectrum of the dye. And the more, of course, wavelengths you have available, the more dyes you can use. But simulated emission, as, as we all know, is a very fundamental phenomenon that takes place basically with any flow form. Now, a strength of the method is, of course, to record dynamics. And uh, I would like to show some applications to the dynamic changes. Because if it's an electron microscope, it's very hard to, to observe dynamics, and it's not really viable with live cells because the vacuum requirements are very, very strict conditions. Now, here we see, see a stretch of a dendrite, and these are the so-called uh, spine 
spine necks and spines. So these are so-called postsynaptic sites. So you can imagine there's another neuron here and it gives a signal to this neuron and then it goes to the axon, um, for example. Now, what we see with this microscope is now changes over time. So zero times 0, 0.0, 140, 160, 180 seconds, and one can see how this these uh, postsynaptic uh, uh, sites are formed. Now, why are these changes in morphology so important? It's, this is taken out of a hippocampal uh, tissue slice of a, of a, of a uh, rat. Um, it's important because it's known that these morphological changes are critical when, when we learn something for long-term uh, long memory formation. So, and this is, uh, we hope actually that the STED microscope in particular uh, will play an important role in deciphering the role of these morphological changes, uh, for example, when in learning and, and finding out, and helping, helping us find out what's going on uh, when we memorize, for example. Now, important, of course, for such a method is uh, uh, that is able to penetrate sort of deeply into the tissue. And this is a, a sort of technical slide showing that here it's 10 microns deep in the brain. This is 25 microns deep in the brain. Still, the resolution is still there. It's better than 68 because this is just a profile. And then it's uh, seven, uh, 65 microns deep down, 150 mi microns deep down in a living um, brain slice. And this is, this is quite OK. But we have not used things like active or adaptive optics in here. And I think once we do that, it will be even better. Now, another remark that I would like to make here, this is um, the stat on a, on a yellow fluorescent protein. So this is a genetically encoded protein that is pr produced by the living organism. Now, this is dynamics on the second scale, but what about faster dynamics um, to switch gears a bit? Now, this is beats on a glycerol film, recorded normally, and then you switch on stat. And you see, all of a sudden, we can, you see individual particles moving in here, whereas in the, in the normal microscope, we don't. So it, this shows that we can pass the diffraction barrier and at the same time be fast. The requirement is, of course, that we get enough photons per second. So if it's bright enough, we can do that. Here it's 80 frames per second. So actually, the display here is about two and a half times slower than the actual recording. Now, this has implications if you study, for example, um, uh, such things as diffusion or um, yeah, particle uh, behavior uh, and so on, um, colloidal crystals, for example, formation. Now, to switch back to, um, uh, to biology, uh, we thought that, OK, if you have such a system that is able to image beyond the refraction barrier and you want to, say, apply, for example, to neurophysiology, an important application is to, 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 to image for the first time the movement of individual synaptic vesicles in a living axon, for example. Now, as I mentioned already, so neurons have these little containers. The vesicles are about 30, 40 nanometers in size. But it's hard to follow um, the movement of individual synaptic vesicles if they are densely packed. So this is a kind of focal snapshot. You see almost nothing, it's, so it's packed. But now we do it with that. And now you see the movement of these individual synaptic vesicles recording at 28 frames per second. So it's sort of real-time uh, recording. Now, this is not random motion. Uh, this motion really makes sense. You can change this motion. And the person who was really critical in this study, uh, Silvio Rizzoli, has taken the study further um, to learn about how um, uh, these synaptic vesicles move about. And, and he found out, for example, they move differently if they're freshly incorporated um, than later on, for example. OK. So this is the, um, the implications of, uh, of, um, of different fields. So I'm coming back to the basic physics, of course. Now, it's obvious that we can go beyond the diffraction barrier. But the question comes up now, what is the resolution gain that we can have? Is there a new barrier? Or what does this mean, actually? So what are the limits? So what is the obtainable resolution? Now, to explain this in a very simplistic gen general manner, I'm coming back to the initial slide. Now, I think you, I was quite clear about the fact that the gain in resolution is, is due to the fact that we turn off, say, the signaling capability of some of the features in here. And so we confine the signaling capability, the fluorescence capability, to very small dimensions. That dimension is, of course, smaller than Abyss diffraction barrier. And so if we increase the intensity further and further and further, so the peak intensity of the donut in here, then the resolution D cannot be given by Abyss equation anymore. And it's also clear that the ratio I which is the intensity in here, over IS, over that threshold intensity, must be somehow in the denominator. Because if it, um, if it gets larger and larger, D must get smaller. So it must be here. Now, if you do the calculation right, 
you will find out it's not just the ratio i over s is is the square root of the ratio i over s. I can explain this uh, at the end. Now this equation is okay, but just about okay, because if we stop the red beam. If we stop that simulating beam here, then we would have a normal microscope and we would have normal, a normal resolution, obvious resolution. But if, if the beam is stopped, then i would be 0 and the square root of 0 would be 0. And of course, we would divide by 0, and so the equation wouldn't hold anymore. We can easily fix that. If you're an experimental physicist, you just put a unit in here and everything is fine. And so this equation is really fine. It explains the situation quite well. So, if i is 0, you have a normal resolution. If i becomes large of is, if this number becomes large, 5, 10, 100, and so on, then d becomes very small. And so, it also means it can, very, it can become very small, obviously, but we can also tune it. And that's good, because it means that if the resolution need not be that large, why when you see you have a, uh, something at 5 nanometer resolution if the structure is 50 nanometer? You can grab, of course, the signal from many molecules, as it is shown in here. And then you can be faster. Because if you turn off many, then, then you have to scan very densely. You have to do the thing, the time on off switching many times. And, have to, to, uh, and, and, you, and that goes, of course, at the expense of recording time. So you can play, of course, and tune the speed of recording with resolution. You can, you can adjust them according to the needs that you have. OK, so here are poor spatial resolution. And here the resolution becomes higher because the density is cranked up So by tuning it. But now. From the more basic viewpoint, one might ask, what is the contribution of this concept of the art of microscopy per se, if you view it perspective? Well, I think there are two of them. First of all, it's the first concept that broke the diffraction barrier by playing an on-off game, making sure that all the molecules are flooded with, say, excitation light are capable of emitting. But then, of course, it also made abundantly clear that, can, that you can really break the diffraction barrier. Now, if you have two molecules, falling very close at molecular distance, this 5 nanometer distance. Can we separate the two? Yes, in principle, of course we can. If you switch this one off, we see the signal of that one. By switching that one off, we see the signal of that one, although they are very, very close. And this is how we can have, of course, resolution at a molecular scale. Shown in here. Now we turn this one off to see that one, and then we turn this one off to see that one. And so we can resolve conceptually with molecular resolution with focus visible light. So in other words, the diffraction barrier has not been shifted just to a new barrier, but it has been truly broken. And you can have molecular scale resolution with visible light and regular lenses. And this is actually reflected here in the equation, because if i becomes large over the threshold is, then d goes vir virtually down to 0, at least to the molecular dimensions. Now the question is, what does this actually mean, i becomes large over is? What is the meaning of this? Well, I think it's obvious. Uh, I'm going back to this cartoon now, this on-off, um, and this kind of exponential curve. Well, it means that this curve becomes very steep. If is is small with respect to i, or i small with respect to um, is, then, then uh, this curve must be very, very steep. In other words, if we have a perfect on-off switch, if we switch perfectly, we must be able to get a very, very high spatial resolution. Now the question is, can you produce such a sort of perfect on-off switch in reality? Now with organic molecules, um, it's maybe not that easy because, of course, if you increase the intensity, you, one may, may say that there may be additional transitions going on that will lead to photo bleaching and so on. Uh, I wouldn't sub subscribe that entirely, as you will see in a second. But clearly, there's a challenge. But there are, of course, inorganic flow for many of you will be aware of that do the job already. You can think of, for, of course, for example, of color centers. And I'd like to show you an example here with a very specific color centers that have been, actually, in the science of it, has been very much pushed by Jörg Wachtrup at the University of Stuttgart, who pioneered um, uh, say the study of charged nitrogen vacancies in diamond for various reasons. And he found out in uh, the mid-'90s that these are very, very photostable. And because they are so photostable, we thought, OK, let's try to do um, uh, that stat trick, that on-off trick, uh, with these charged nitrogen vacancies in diamonds, so with this, with this yeah, uh, color center flow force. And here it is. This is not a cartoon anymore. This is a measurement. This is true on-off. And you can do that as often as you like, because there's no chemical reaction going on that would destroy the flow force. And that has indeed allowed us to demonstrate something very sharp. So here, 220 nanometers would be the standard resolution here. It's about 8 nanometers 
in size, meaning that you can really discern in principle things that are that close because you turn them off if they're here, but they are allowed to be on only if they're here. And so it's a physical demonstration that these kind of resolutions are not just a dream, but they are attainable. Now, to give you an example, so these are color centers in diamond, bulk diamond. This is normal recording, you don't see them because um, they are too close. But here with a spatial resolution, in this case 20 nanometers, you can separate them. You can record them many times as you like because there's no photoreaction going on that will destroy them. And so this is a, just a confocal comparison, it goes on like this. You can collect as many photons basically as you want, as long as the system is stable, of course. Now, that's nice because there is no bleaching and you can have constant resolution to any diamonds. As a side remark to the biologist's view, if you make little diamonds out of those spark diamonds and attach them to a probe that you have a wonderful floor for, you can take as many pictures as you want, there will be no degradation. So this is a very fascinating prospect. I think that will come to fruition um, uh, sooner than later. But if you get so many photons, you can say, well, I'm collecting here plenty, plenty of photons, and then it must get a very crisp image. And because I'm getting a very crisp image, and since these defects, these color centers are separated already, I, can know, I know exactly at which position they have emitted because these are individual emitters. And so I can easily calculate um, the centroid, of course, and that's the position of their emission. This is, this is not this is obvious. This is not a breaking of the diffraction barrier, of course. This is just, we know this point emitters, and so we can calculate the center of gravity of emission, then we know the coordinates. But the risk of sounding dramatic, too dramatic. This is 1.5 angstrom with precision. We can get the position, and this is what you get in the normal microscope for nothing. You see nothing. And it really tells you that something has happened. Here you see the individual color centers defect in the bulk diamond uh, with atomic sort of precision. Here you see nothing. OK. Now, this is just physics. That's, that's a remark that I'm making, making here. There are many implications. They have interesting spin states and so on. I don't want to dwell on that. Um, but uh, I would like to mention something else at this point. This on-off principle, which is underlying the STAT principle, is by far more general than using stimulated emission. This is really important. So, as suggested initially, of course, the first suggestion was to use stimulated emission. And this was, of course, important. Why? Because stimulated emission, if you think about this, is certainly the most fundamental way of turning off a dye, of switching the fluorescence capability of the dye. And it's the most general way of turning on and off the fluorescence capability of a dye. Why? Because it directly acts on the fluorescent state. It directly disturbs the fluorescent state, kicking down to the ground state. But this generality, or fundamentality, comes at a price. And the price that we pay is we have to make sure that there is always a photon there within that nanosecond lifetime of the fluorescent state. That's the time in which you have to act. There's always a photon that instantly kicks down the molecule to the ground state. So if the beam is too weak, the simulating beam, the, the, the beam will miss the excited state photon, and so the photon will uh, uh, excite the molecule, and the molecule will be able to emit. And this is the reason why we have to put in a strong beam, because the lifetime of that excited state is very short. The window of action is very, very short. So in other words, it means, OK, if this is a bottleneck, if this is a problem, there must be other on-off transitions out there in a dye or in a material that do not push us so hard in terms of time, in terms of action. If we switch something between long-lived states, there's more time that is given to us, and so we can apply beams that are less intense because we don't need to put in the photons so quickly. And so if you think about that, again, if you're just trained as a physicist, uh, then you say, oh, one option is to flip a spin. These organic molecules, they have a so-called um, triplet state, dark state, um, spin state. This is the so-called singlet state in which they are emitting, by the way. Um, and if you flip a spin and put them to a triplet state, then they're not able to emit because, because once in a triplet state, they stay there for a microsecond, they won't come down that easily to the ground state because that's a spin-forbidden dipole transition in that sense, or as uh, um, a dipole transition, spin-forbidden, of course. And so there's no way for the molecule to come easily in here. It stays there for some time. It's a metastable state. And now we can switch off, so to speak, to die by parking it in the triplet state that works uh, by strong excitation, of course. And then there is a, always some probability of crossing to the triplet state if there is 
um, enough spin orbit coupling. And so you can play the on-off game with something that has a much longer lifetime, say microseconds, as opposed to nanoseconds. And so the threshold of intensity goes down by three orders of magnitude kilowatts, not megawatts per square centimeter. And so this was the idea behind this concept, which I call ground state depletion. Deplete the ground state parking and triple state to make them dark. Now, once you have realized that you can flip and spin, then you know, well, maybe you can also flip an atom. And if the states, of course, like cis trans isomerization is what a chemist would, for example, say, um, if one of the states or both states are, in fact, long lived states, then there's enough time to produce that on off difference in state, this on off disparity in states. And there are even proteins that can be switched on and off, for example, with a cis trans uh, transition, uh, isomerization. And of course, um, these are very handy because they're genetically encoded. So when I so realized this in the generality of this, I saw I cannot call this concept STAT anymore because it has nothing to do with stimulated emission. One has to generalize this. And so this has been generalized under the name RESOLVE. This is this acronym which stands sort of for reversible, say, saturable or switchable transitions between two, two states. I worked hard on it to make it sound right. It almost sounds right. But the net outcome is that, again, all these molecules, in principle, would be flooded with excitation light because we cannot make that, that spot of excitation light any smaller. We're limited by diffraction. But we turn these molecules off with a beam of light that spares out some, some of the molecules that give us a certain location. And then, of course, only these molecules will be allowed to emit. But again, it's not done by stimulated emission. It's done by, by uh, say, a spin flip, or it's done by cis-trans isomerization or something. And this operates, of course, at lower power. So the same thing, the same story, but at much, much, much lower light levels. Now, initially, of course, I should say, and you, if you look at the, uh, the numbers, dates 95 and, and 2003 or so, 97, um, it didn't work that well because the fluorescent protein that were available at that time didn't switch off very often, on and off very often. But this is exactly what you have to do, of course, if you play this trick, because as you can imagine, if I'm moving such a, a beam that turns on and off the fluorescent photon, I have to turn them on and off many times. And there is a thing called switching fatigue. And, and if you can switch them, say, only a few times, then the method will not work. And so we had to go, um, uh, to go through the effort of developing, say, switchable fluorescent proteins, reversible switchable fluorescent proteins. And we did that um, in the department that I work in. And so we came up very recently, so this is very recent work that is going to be published actually next week, uh, where we showed that you can turn off a specific protein that we designed 1,200 times. And this has allowed us to, to resolve, for example, this um, uh, dendrite uh, in the living hippocampal organotypical slice with high spatial resolution you see it over time with this concept. But the point here, at a million times lower intensities than that with that. So the breakout of diffraction barrier is not an intensity game per se. It's an on-off game. And if you can realize this on-off game with much, much, much lower light levels, then you're done. And this is, of course, very interesting. We think this concept uh, will be very, very important in the future. And these are the, just the first examples. Now, as I said, a drawback of doing it like this, so defining where the molecule is on and off with a beam of light that has a zero, such as a donut, is that you turn the molecule on and off many times. And molecules usually don't like to do that, uh, or that many of them don't like to do that. In the interim, since we suggested this, another concept came up, uh, which runs under the name Palm Storm. Now, this concept, Palm Storm, I'm briefly explaining this concept to you, uses, say, cis trans isomerization, so switching or on-off switching be between metastable states as well. So this was not new. But there was something that was very new and different to the concept that we had developed at that time. Instead of determining with a pattern beam of light containing a zero at some point where the molecules are on and where they are off, where they have to be on and where they should be off, uh, here it is done randomly, molecule by molecule. You apply a beam of light, for example, to molecules that are initially in the off state, such that only one molecule within the 200 nanometer region is turned to the on state, for example, by cis trans isolation. So the rest will stay dark in here. But that molecule is on. And if that molecule, because it's on, emits many photons in a bunch, 
then you can find out where it's on. Because initially, if it's just turning on stochastically in space, you don't know where it's turned on. So you have to find it out. And this can be done by a grid detector. For example, a camera. So image it on a camera. Then you find its position, then locate it, make a tick mark on its coordinate, and you know where it is. Then you do the same thing with the next and the next. And so you can reconstruct the, um, uh, uh, the sample basically in space. This is why some people call it storms, a stochastic optical reconstruction. But again, it's the on-off game that does the job. Now, this concept has major strengths. There is no doubt about the fact. And one major strength is you need only one on-off cycle to do the trick, so per molecule. Disadvantages are here as well. Now, the name, as it was suggested, of course, this stands for photoactivation localization microscopy. It suggested that you need special flow force, just this flow force. But it's very important to understand the basics of something. And if you understand the basics of something, then you know uh, actually what it, what it implies. And so, since we knew that you can also switch dyes by making this transition to, a, um, to the metastable state here by a spin flip, for example, it was clear um, that, well, you can, of course, use any dye. For example, any rhodamine or so that, is, that would normally produce light, for instance, if you excite, uh, excite it with excitation light very clearly, but you can excite it so hard that most of the molecules go to the triplet state, but only one of them is left over. And then you can locate that molecule. You can do the same trick, the stochastic game. So you can use also spin flit not uh, in order to produce this type of stochastic imaging, not just this special fluor force. And this was important because it's generalized the method. So basically means you can do it with any standard rhodamine or typical floor four. And uh, this is just an example here. Um, this is three colors recording with, these are basically rhodamine derivatives of most of them. And, uh, and this is currently the simplest way of producing a subdiffraction resolution image uh, with, um, um, yeah, with a yeah, regular uh, uh, focus in light microscope. To some extent, it also works in living cells. Uh, and it, of course, it has also disadvantages. Imaging fast is not so easy. It's also becoming, or has become commercially available, and it seems to become very, very popular. Now, coming towards the end, of course, you've seen several acronyms. And the few of you, perhaps, who have followed the literature, they are they're acquainted with the fact that many acronyms are there. But if you do this as a science, of course, then you ask yourself, why, why is this the reason why we can do now these pictures? It's obvious that we can do the pictures, but 15 years back, uh, we couldn't take this picture. So there must, something, there must be a sort of ingredient in, in, um, in the image formation that has led to this transition. So the question is now, what is it? Why can we take these pictures? Why can we do them now? We couldn't do them 15 years back. Is the fact that we make donuts? Of course not. People have made donuts and all kinds of features or focal shapes in, a, in an objective lens, but they couldn't take sharper pictures. Is it the fact that individual molecules are located in some cases? Of course not. People did that before and tracked the position of individual molecules, yet they couldn't take a picture. So it must be something else. There must be something else as a common enabling element that allows us now to take the picture. So what is it? I think it's very clear by now. It's the on-off game. It's the on-off transition. So we use a mechanism for preventing signal. That's the whole trick. No matter how we do it, either say in this mode where we determine the pattern of light, where the molecules have to be off and they're allowed to meet only here, either with stimulated emission or with a spin flip or cis trans isomerization, you can choose your own transition or you can do it either stochastically, so molecule by molecule. And then here, of course, the molecules are not allowed to emit because they are in a state which doesn't permit them to signal. And so we can discern the features because not all the molecules are allowed to emit despite of the fact that all the molecules are flooded with excitation light, so with light that will potentially produce signal. That's the trick. And this is why we can take the pictures now. Now, there are currently two families. So, so this one, with, which is deterministic, and this one, which is stochastic, and each one has its strengths and weaknesses, and they differ in a way. So here you can have many molecules at the same time and you need only a few photons to generate a meaningful signal because they know if there are a few photons coming, you know, okay, there's such a thing like a microtubule or any feature in here. Here you can see only one molecule at a time within this diffraction region and you need many photons, many photons to get a meaningful signal because you need to locate that posi uh, position of that molecule and you need many photons for that. So this is clearly a disadvantage of the stochastic method. The stochastic method has also a strong advantage. 
you need only one on-off switching cycle to produce an image, and so it works with any lousy switchable molecule. Here you have, they have good switchable molecules that can be turned on and off many times. And so each of the families has its strengths and weaknesses. Now, with that, I would like to mention that this is done with that, and it was done with that, and it's a video recording, and the reason for that is very simple. This is a method that, that determines where the signal is generated, and there can be many molecules in here, and this is why we are so fast. So the strength of the deterministic method is that it's, it's good at producing fast images. There are many implications, including in the, say, polymer sciences, I didn't show it, show it here. Um, uh, uh, this is biophysics, lipid formation, and so on. I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm finally acknowledging the people who have uh, yeah, contributed to this development, PhD students, highly motivated postdocs, of course. Uh, I would highlight Stefan Jacobs, for example, who has many contributions, of course, to developing these reversible uh, switchable proteins and the recent data that I've shown uh, just now. Now, with that, of course, I'm coming um, to my final slide. This is Arbus equation. It's very obvious that Arbus equation, if you will, um, does no longer hold. We are able now to discern features that are closer than what is given by this equation. So we can modify it. That's not very difficult. We have shown how we can do that. We just plug in the square root factor. And now, of course, we can account for the new situation. But the question that is coming now is, what does this actually stand for? What is actually the new ingredient? And as I said, why can we take now these pictures? And it's worth by spending a few thoughts on this. Now you may ask, why is it the square root, by the way? Well, that's not very difficult to explain. You've seen we have confined a state, say the emissive state, with a beam of light that has a zero. Now, if you approximate that, that zero, in first approximation, if you do a Taylor series, it's really a parabola, quadratic term. And this must be the inverse function of it. So, so this is the reason why this is a square root. So this is not surprising. Again, you see the resolution scales with the wavelength. It still scales with the wavelength, and it must scale with the wavelength because we work with diffracted beams. We don't break diffraction. Diffraction is still there. But we break the barrier set by diffraction because although the resolution scales with the wavelength, it is not limited by the wavelengths. Because if this expression becomes large, then d becomes arbitrarily small. So the question is now, what does this expression stand for? What is, does this i over s stand for if we make that large? Well, i over s stands for that transition between one state to the other. Because the larger we make, the stronger that gradient of states will be induced by this ratio i over s. The intensity induces, induces a difference in state. So if you ask me what broke the diffraction barrier in the end, what is new that has been introduced in here? It is what has been introduced is the transition of states. This is just about waves, but this is the states. So putting in the states in the equation, this is what changed matters. And if you ask me then, why uh, hasn't this happened before? Or why did it take so much time? My personal view, and this is just my personal view, is people were, were somehow uh, distracted by the fact that there is waves and there is diffraction. So we're constantly focused, focused on, on diffraction. Diffraction, there's waves, diffraction. Because there is diffraction, it will be very hard to get beyond the diffraction barrier because, because of that. And they didn't think about introducing the states. Once you put in the states, you don't have to worry about the waves anymore. Also, near field optics, for example, to make a special remark, this is a method by which you can find, of course, the wave propagation with a small tip. That's about waves. Not so very easy to do because it's about waves. Or if you think about things like so called metamaterials, where you try to, to change the way um, the waves propagate through a material, that's also very hard. This is much simpler. Use the thermal states. Once you have a transition that allows you to separate things with states, you're done and you don't have to worry about the waves. And this also tells us that this is not fundamentally limited to fluorescence. Any set of states that allow you to distinguish the signal that they produce will work in the end. And so in essence, this is very general. It means once we introduce the states of the material into the resolution problem, we have won. We don't have to worry about the waves anymore. And this is the main message of the day. Thank you very much.